So the town crier, oh yay, oh yay, oh yay, contains some important information. Oh, yeah. It's right, you're not going to get it all again. It's okay. Don't panic. What we're going to be doing is looking at Revelation 3, 7 to 13, and one or two other passages as well. Remember that the town crier's message is concise, clear, and informative. The scroll is rolled up and the town crier walks away to another strategic location to repeat the important message. And that's a little bit about the, the passages in Revelation, in Revelation 2 and 3, where we read the letters that God has for his people. We're a bit like town criers, or perhaps we should be. We have a message to proclaim that is important and concise. So let's read through Revelation 3, verses 7 to 12. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world and to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. The bottom line is that Jesus is coming again. It's news which is too good to keep to ourselves and worthy to tell others of even shouting it out. So following the traditional nature of the town crier and the classic Spurgeon sermon format, I've got three oh yays for you. <clears throat> oh yay, Jesus died. Oh yay, Jesus rose again. Oh yay, he's coming back. It's an important message that matters. So this morning, I thought we'd take a look at it so that we could be ready to proclaim it to others. And in the end, we're going to proclaim it in a simple song. So, oh, yay, Jesus died for you. It was a long roller coaster of a journey that took Jesus to the cross. During his time on earth, he experienced the ups and the downs of life in just the same way as we do. Jesus's heart must have been lifted and delighted when Peter acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah. It had taken a long time for the up to come, but the penny had final drop, finally dropped, and Jesus was encouraged by Peter's profession. <coughs> to counter that, the downs came as so many rejected the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah that they longed for. We might think of the priests in particular, but what of the crowd who shouted for Barabbas to be released? 
when he could have shouted for Jesus's release. I'm sure you have your ups and your downs as well. It's easy to focus on the downs. But let's try and celebrate the ups and remember that Jesus had downs as well. And he understands how you feel. So the ups and the downs, but alongside the ups and the downs, there's the joys and the sorrows. We know that Jesus wept with sorrow as he lost his friend Lazarus. And then he wept again for Jerusalem. But Jesus knew the joy that reverberates around heaven. And as he said in Luke 15, verse 7, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I love the song, for the joys and for the sorrows, for this we have Jesus. We know that Jesus has, as we say, been there, done that. So let's be encouraged when we're sad and rely on Jesus to turn the sorrows into joy. Oh, yay. Jesus died for you, knowing the experiences we face and can realistically come alongside us in the pain of our downs and our sorrows. That's worth not only knowing, but then proclaiming through our testimony of how God has been close to us in those difficult times. But then there's the ups and the downs that brought the pain. Jesus went further on his journey than any of us. The cross was a painful experience in every way. We naturally think of the physical pain. And there was certainly a lot of that as the nails pierced his hands and his feet after the whipping that he endured. But think also of the spiritual pain, which was so real to Jesus. John points to this in his account when he records that it was night as Judas left to betray Jesus to the authorities. It's perfectly legitimate to interpret these words, not just as the hours of physical darkness, but the time of spiritual darkness that Jesus, the light of the world, was entering. But perhaps the most painful experience for Jesus was the emotional pain that he suffered. He expressed these words, didn't he? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, family breakdown is always a painful time on the emotions. The intimate relationship with Jesus expressed when he said, I and the Father are one, was painfully broken. When we find our relationship with parents or other loved ones is strained, we can take comfort in the fact that Jesus is always there when others are not. He knows what it means to be adrift from family intimacy. So, oh yay, Jesus went to Calvary. Why? Well, for me and for you. He endured life on earth so that he can know our problems before suffering the painful end of his life on earth to pay the penalty for our sin. That's worth proclaiming. Thank you, Jesus. But oh yay, yeah. Jesus rose again. Surely that's worth shouting about and proclaiming to the world. It was such an amazing happening that those closest to Jesus found it hard to fathom. Some of them had seen Jesus call Lazarus out of the tomb. And then there was also the raising of Jairus' daughter. But this was different. Jesus himself had risen and was appearing to his family, friends and disciples. Again, this was a total experience. Jesus showed that he had power over physical death. The grave could not hold him. It was power in the spiritual realms. Satan and the principalities and powers had been defeated. Death no longer reigned. And thirdly, the barrier of sin had prevented the father looking at Jesus. That had been broken down. 
the relationship with his father was restored. Imagine the emotional healing that was Jesus's experience. The healing which Jesus's resurrection brought affected every part of Jesus. <clears throat> he was, if you like, a new creation. And that same healing is given to us when we ask Jesus to forgive our sin and invite him into our lives. We are a new creation, born spiritually with the promise of eternal life. <clears throat> that truth is demonstrated so clearly in believers' baptism as we rise from the watery grave into a new life. That's worth proclaiming. Oh, yay. Jesus offers complete healing, physical, spiritual, and emotional, to bring us what Hebrew describes as shalom, which translates as wholeness in English. But there's more. The third, oh, yay. Jesus is coming back again. We have that great promise. We don't know when this will occur, but it will be the fulfillment of Revelation 1, verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Well, there are many descriptions of the period leading up to Jesus's return. There's mention of the various signs of his impending return. Some sects have confidently predicted the date of his return. But many of these have been gone, no effect. I read an internet post the other day that starts, I know the date that Jesus will return. Further into the article, he declares, Jesus will return on March the 5th, 2014. <laughs> to be fair, he also says, this whole post is a prank. <laughs> but there are still others who offer dates. Jehovah's Witnesses have put a strange spin on the second coming of Jesus Christ. This was due to the failure of a prophecy by them that he was re going to return visibly in 1914. And that was an update on the 1874 date. And these, Jesus didn't show up on their date. They were forced to explain away the failure by twisting scripture. The fact is that we can't precisely know when Jesus will return. Jesus told the disciples and us. But at that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. <clears throat> We can't know the exact time. He doesn't want us to know. He wants us to long for that day. Pray for it. Be prepared for it. And wait patiently. And false preachers are continually predicting exact dates for the end of the world. It just adds up to the amusement and scepticism of many people. It's not hard to see why many people don't believe that Jesus will return at all. Peter prophesied that scoffers would come in the last days, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 2 Peter 3 verse 4. Well, I prefer to follow Jesus than popular opinion. He said that after the tribulation would come signs in the heavens and then he would return to the earth with the great sound of the trumpet. He will return to the earth through the clouds in the same way that he left through the cloud. Jesus's return will bring the completion of his work. At that time, we know that the dead will rise and receive new physical bodies with no more suffering. In the spiritual dimension, we will be at one with God as there will be no more sin. And if that doesn't touch your emotions, then you need to take a closer look. Closer look. 
Oh, yay. Jesus is coming again. Let's proclaim that. So in our summary, oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Thank you, Jesus. We've seen that Jesus died, rose and is coming again. Let's proclaim the good news to everyone we meet. I like Simon's acronym from last Sunday. God offers sinful people eternal life. That's the gospel. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you found that sermon helpful and would like to join us again on another Sunday. In the meantime, you'll find resources available at our website, on YouTube. So please do take the opportunity to have a look, but let's hope to see you soon. God bless you.